Good evening and welcome here tonight to tonight's 5x15 and uh, have we got a treat for you, certainly for me without a doubt. I'm really delighted that we're going to be welcoming two extremely remarkable people to 5x15 tonight, Abby Morgan and David. David Nichols. Abby is the BAFTA and Emmy Award winning playwright and screenwriter behind, behind films like The Iron Lady, The Hour, Brick Lane and Shame, plus of course the riveting TV series The Split. But she's also, and this is what she's going to be talking about tonight, the author of a, a book, a new book, an autobiography. It's called This Is Not A Pity Memoir. And it's her own story of living with her partner's devastating illness. It's a amazing book it's full of laughter and insight and it, it's pretty tough in places and she will be uh telling david i hope all about it but they will also be talking about things many things they have in common like film adaptations david of course is the extraordinary author of one day and so many other huge bestsellers and he's written five bestsellers and a lot of screenplays which include the new version of Far From the Madding Crowd and my own personal favourite, I think, TV adaptation of my life, which was the Melrose books, which were written by Edward St. Aubin and which I thought personally could never be adapted for television. And it was a great triumph. Um, both of all their books, uh, Abby's books and David's books, are available through our bookseller, New and Books. The details will be in the chat. And um, they are going to talk for about 45 minutes and then we'll take your questions. And do please put, put questions in for both of them about all the aspects of both their fantastic careers. So I'll now slither away and hand over with many thanks and much anticipation to David. Thank you. Thank you, Rosie. That's very kind of you. And it's a real pleasure to be here uh, with everyone. Thank you all. Um, Abby, I realize I, I've known, uh, I did the maths, Abby. I think it's 24 years now. Um, oh. uh, I first met Abby when she was working on her first original TV drama called My Fragile Heart. And I was uh, working as a script editor at that time. And so we bump into each other in the office and I read her wonderful scripts. And since then, you know, I've obviously become a huge fan and there's wonderful films and television series I've admired hugely, but the small kind of mean uh, competitive part of me has always felt, well, at least she hasn't written a book. <laughs> and now you have, and it's a really wonderful, beautiful book, a really extraordinary book, I think. Um, which I read at, uh, at an early stage before publication and, and I've been rereading with such admiration. And I suppose my first question was really about the process of writing that book, because what I, I love about it is it has both the immediacy of a diary, you know, a present tense account of, of events, but also a, a kind of very, a, the thoughtfulness of something written in retrospect. And I want to know about the genesis of the book and the, mm. the process of writing it. Uh, well, first, let me just say, it's just lovely to be talking to you and really calm your pen. It's all OK, because I was certainly <laughs> not snapping at your heels. I mean, I think, I think, my gosh, I mean, hats off to you. I remember I remember meeting a, a friend of my mum's who's a novelist when I was about 20 and I was saying, yeah, I'm going to write a novel. I'm now 54 and I have yet to write a novel, but yes, I've written a memoir. And in many ways, um, you know, memoirs, are kind of fascinating to me anyway. I mean, but it's sort of inbuilt in the title that I, one of the first memoirs I absolutely adored was Ruth Picardy's Before I Say Goodbye. And in fact, you know, the book acknowledges uh, one of my first conversations I had with Jacob, my partner, who's really at the heart of this book, uh, when we met at a dinner party and I was trying to chase the rights to that beautiful memoir, which was, of course, the last few months of, of Ruth Picardy's life, fantastic journalist writer as she wrote beautifully about breast cancer and, and just the kind, of, the kind of highs and lows and pain and comedy of what it's like to be facing your death. And so I'd always been very inspired by that kind of writing, but I guess when, you know, when this medical crisis hit us, because it was really a medical crisis, um, just to give a little bit of a background for anyone who hasn't read the book, but in June, 2018, um, Jacob, my partner and actor, father of, uh, my two teenage children um, collapsed with a brain seizure and so ensued kind of what's really still feels like sort of four very crazy years um, and and in many ways I feel like the, the world has gone through such a crazy time as well but but I guess what 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 
drew me to writing was at the heart of Jacob's collapse and a, a very long period, um, nearly seven months uh, in a coma was a key thing, which is when he woke up, he woke up with a really rare delusion called Capgra delusion, which is the belief in doubles or imposters. And um, that can often be focused on anything from a pet to a property, but more than likely it's focused to the person you're most close to. And in this case, it was me. And so Jacob woke up not knowing who I was and, and the belief that although he had spent the last 18 years with Abby Morgan, I was not that Abby Morgan. And so began this kind of split life that really went on for about 18 months, really. Um, and I guess the book came out of that kind of crazy period, not only, you know, the process of going through the kind of catastrophe that Jacob went through, um, but also, you know, really having to assess who we were as a couple, who I was, um, when Jacob woke up and didn't know who I was and who we were in relation to the last 18 years we had together, the life we had together, the children we had together. Um, and so the book really came out of initially a kind of 100 day diary I'd started in the mid very early on the first night <clears throat> Jacob collapsed, I came home and I started to write to him saying this is what happened to you today because I think if you go through a surreal trauma and it is genuinely surreal it is outside of the norm outside of reality you feel like you have to a little like a detective keep keep hold of all the, the little bits of evidence details you know data that you collect along the way and so the book kind of poured out of me um and I've you you know I often really admire writers who talk about you know books that pour out of them novels that they you know they couldn't not write and I've never ever had that with writing I've always had that kind of staring at a blank page you know a lot of internet shopping and eventually starting something around midday and so for me to find myself and really it the writing began at the start of the second lockdown and this is when Jacob had come home and he'd started his rehabilitation and was I could start to see chinks of light that I started to write the book and so um, I don't know if I've got a novel in me and I really hope I've not got another memoir in me because um, I kind of feel like I don't yeah. ever want to look at my life that closely again but I guess the screenwriter in me was so alert that I felt like I had to get it down on on, on the page really. I mean I, I, I were you were you were writing a diary before that or were you responding to the to the emergency totally situation. Totally emergency of the situation. I mean, I'm okay. someone, I'm, I mean, like, I think every writer, um, I remember hearing David Hare, I don't know if this is true or not, saying that he tends not to keep notes, he just remembers the stuff that's important. And I sort of took on that philosophy for a long time, but the older I've got, the more I've had to keep fragments and details the whole mm. time. And the joy of the digital phone, you know, the joy of the phone now is it becomes mm. your everything. So. I found myself in hospital recording, videoing, and then at night, I think because I couldn't sleep, because I was probably profoundly traumatized. Um, and because no one tells you about a coma, Jake, after two weeks of what was effectively a cognitive, um, psychotic, physical breakdown, the decision was taken to place Jake in a medically induced coma. Uh, and so he, he went into a coma the end of June, 2018 and woke the end of January, 2019. But nobody tells you a coma yeah. is weirdly active for everybody who's who's working to keep that person alive. But for the rest of you, it's like you are the audience, you are the onlookers, you are you are that other person in the room watching as everyone else um, works to save and and move and and look after the person you love most in the world. And so I found myself at night almost having to go back over my day. And the way I did that was I started to write. A diary to myself but no I hadn't you know I'm not one of those people who had start, started writing when I was you know straight out of the womb and I was totally um, you know nothing memorable about me in my academic career in any way or, or form but I kind of came to writing when I was at university and I look back now and I was a storyteller in terms of I love telling the you know yeah. the overblown story to family or friends but I think the diary writing probably did go back to something I had done a little bit as a teenager um, and I kind of came back to so I found it an incredible comfort in the middle of it really and I guess it's the first time you know most of what we do we're you know we're, we're kind of pulling from either incredible research or resource or or or, or someone else's work of fiction um, or, or fact but for the first time ever I had this incredible body of of and source yeah. material really that was unfolding in front of me and so I couldn't not do anything but write it but and interestingly it was really lockdown right 
was the reason why I put it into prose because you know I talk a little bit about it in the book but I decided I was going to try and write a play I had a crazy idea when mm -hmm. Jacob came home that I was going to write a play and Jacob was going to star in it and we'd bring all the therapists on and actors would play therapists and it would become this amazing way to help rehabilitate him and then COVID happened and the theatres closed down and I thought well you know actually what I still have is my laptop and me and my kitchen yeah. so I found myself writing at night and that's really how the book came about. And the book, the book form was different to the diary form. I mean, yes. did you do a different kind of, because I mean, it's, it's such an emotional book, an affecting book. It seems, it seems um, almost callous to talk about it in technical terms, but what I really, really admired about it was the way that, as you say in the book, a lot of it, illness is, is boring. You know, it's, it's, it's a routine, it's, a, it's very repetitive. Uh, and the book is extremely well structured. I have a terrible tendency when I'm reading fiction in particular to think, well, oh, we don't need the scene. Forgetting, of course, that it's not a screenplay, it's a book, and a book can do different things. A book doesn't have to, you know, a book doesn't, you know, doesn't cost anything to film. It can it can mm -hmm. explore things and in, in more detail and more slowly than than the screenplay. But in this memoir, you almost apply a kind of um screenwriting techniques so that there's constant movement and it's extraordinarily compelling as well as being very emo emotional well thank you i mean i i guess i mean you you know as a screenwriter david you know that actually in so many ways the script is the selling document the script is the conversation mm. you have as a writer to that first reader and so i i'm always aware when i'm writing a screenplay that i'm constantly trying to hold the attention and i think one of the things that was really well, two things happened in parallel, really. One was I was incredibly grateful for the kind of 20 odd years I had in terms of just the kind of writing skills. I'm, I'm not someone who would ever write a book about how to write or even ever tell anyone how to write, but it was very good to find myself in the worst kind of darkest wood that actually my, write, my ability to write and the kind of basic methodology I had within my own work, I, I used with my own experience and it, it really kind of led me out of the kind of chaos and the emotional um, propulsion of the experience because it's incredibly ad adrenalized when, you know, there were several moments in that first six months where it, it looked like Jacob might not live. And, you know, but two things were going on. It was like, one was absolutely overwhelmed and devastated by the experience. And at the same time, there was this very cold icy chip that runs through, I think, through every writer and who was constantly watching and observing. And, the, and one of the biggest things that offended me about the experience were the bad plot twists, you know, the moments yeah. where I thought, well, yeah, this yeah, is yeah. terrible. You know, this will never make it to the screenplay. And it's something I talk about in yeah. the book, but I really felt like that. And then there were other moments where I felt, oh my God, this is extraordinary. I've got to, you know, it was out of body. I stepped out of myself. And I think that was partly survival method. And I think also you are trying to make sense of, um, of what is happening to you. And I think for me, I've talked about this before, but I think I had never realized, I'd, you know, someone who works with deadlines all the time, I hadn't really ever faced the biggest deadline, which is mortality. And when you are facing the mortality of someone you love, and then subsequently my own mortality, um, <clears throat> which is another, <clears throat> as I refer to bad plot twist in the storytelling, um, I, I had to really kind of navigate my way back. And the way I navigated my way back to understanding and making sense of this was to sort of draw on every kind of writing skill I had. So the book is very yeah. much constructed, I think, with the energy and the velocity of those first hundred days, which was probably one of the most intense periods. But actually, um, you know, kind of medical crisis and then, you know, when you're in the middle of the storm and then the aftermath of the storm and the recovery of the storm has a very natural rhythm that actually is quite a dramatic rhythm. Yeah. So in a way, I kind of yeah. draw, you know, also a kind of dramatic structure that I use in film and I, find, I look for in a film, really. Yeah. I mean, I found as a reader, uh, obviously, because I know you socially and professionally, I kind of knew some of the story. But even so, I found what you refer to as, as the plot twists really breathtaking and, and and shocking and I the first of them I suppose the capgras syndrome that you could spend all of this time nurturing and caring and and, 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 and sitting and waiting and finally that looks like as if there's a a positive uh move towards rehab and then this terrible twist of not being recognized of not being acknowledged um as you say it's 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 um it's almost too much but what really comes across in the book 
and which I think you expressed so honestly is is the kind of anger, the, f- the fury. It's very uncensored mm. and, and frank. And I wondered that, how that felt to write um, because I, th- I think you do it very bravely and, 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 and honestly and openly. Well, you know, it's interesting because I think, of course, they're, they're very, you know, I'm very grateful for those words. Um, but it's, you, you, you know, it's really survival. And, you know, people often say, mm-hmm. well, one of the things I think about now is I'm incredibly proud, not of myself as an individual, but as the human spirit, the fight that one has in oneself. And, and in many ways, when mm-hmm. Jacob, um, I describe it like it felt like a very bad drama exercise. You know, it felt like one of those terrible drama exercises where you have to go out of the room and everybody's told to ignore the person when they come back in. And I couldn't, I couldn't, well, two things were running hand in hand, hysteria and comedy and, and a kind of deep sense of kind of pathos and how funny this was. You know, I kept on thinking the whole time, you know, I was talking to Jacob the whole time and I was almost like, I cannot wait to tell you what you did next. I can't wait to <laughs> share this with you because of course, you know, I spent the last 18 years, Jacob was my first port of call on any idea, any story, you know, and, you know, my kids have evolved into that now and they were certainly have been that through over the last four years. So, you know, I, I could feel this story kind of unfolding and brewing. And, um, but I think the human spirit and the fight to survive, weirdly, I think, storytelling is the heart of that I think the reason why we tell stories is to connect to make sense to to relate to find empathy in 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 worlds in in character journey in experiences that we may not have in direct directly experienced and the job of the writer is to try and connect in a way that we can find some universal truths and we can find some connection points and so I guess for me I, I never had I, I appreciated more just how important storytelling was to me and how I've used it in every form to survive. You know, I've used it when I've had a bad day when I was a kid at school. I've used it when I've wanted to connect with people I love. I've used it to try and connect with people I don't really get on with. You know, we tell each other stories. We relate our, our experience. We talk about our days and we often do that to connect. And I guess the biggest thing that had ever happened to me in my life was happening to me but it was also happening to this incredible community of people it was happening to my children to my family to Jake's family who I'm very close to and of course to Jacob and so I felt this huge um weight that I had to tell the story well but in order to tell that I had to tell every element element of the of the experience and of course you're right it was huge indignation actually I was so indignant you know I was so indignant that I was being ignored you know there's a moment where I talk about where you know, Jacob asked me to leave the room because this very sweet woman who I'd suddenly appeared from nowhere was coming in to read the book, which was The Prince's Bride, which is his favorite book, which I had bought him for Christmas. And he was asking if I would leave the room, you know? And so this kind yeah. of, these, these personal slights became this amazing fuel for, for me. And in a way, I think it pushed me forward. And, you know, I always say to Jake, he kind of gave me the greatest gift ever. He gave me the greatest source material ever. So you know, the writing of it in many ways was the easy part. The living of it was the thing that was hard. Mm. Um, and the writing mm, that mm, I mm. feel was the tool I used to understand, process, make sense of the experience. And I guess, bear, you know, to bear witness to it, because if you are living yeah. with someone who doesn't believe you're there, it was almost like I had to bear witness to it. I remember one day, and again, I talk about this. I remember one day asking Jake to test me on everything, you know, his favorite football player, his favorite food, his favorite holiday. And I got every answer right. And Jake looked at me with such a sense of deep suspicion. How was I doing this trick? And I think the writing of the book was also on a really profound way to try and show Jake there was no trick, that I was there, that this is something that I experienced, he experienced. And I guess also to show him what had happened to him. Because what I came to realize is that, you know, it wasn't that Jake had forgotten me, he'd forgotten himself. And it wasn't yeah. he who yeah. was, it wasn't me that was the imposter, it was he that was the imposter. He, he, he was trying to yeah. make sense of his world. So the person's closest, closest to him, if, if I was really me then, he, and he was feeling so differently, then something was seriously wrong. So I had to be an imposter. I had to be something other because I was the truth speaker for him. And so if the truth people were saying this was happening, I think I think that's what that's what I've come to terms and realized was really what was going on. Yeah. I mean it's 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 almost like um arguing with a conspiracy theorist or something, except you have to respond not with indignation, but with patience and understanding. I wondered how your kids felt witnessing that, seeing seeing his 
his rejection of you, his inability to recognize you? Did, well, I think, I think, been... I think as a community, you know, you those mm. you love, it's, it's with disbelief because it, in many ways, there's a kind of cliche with it. We all, we've all seen the film where someone wakes up and goes, I don't know who you are. It's a very mm-hmm. specific thing when they go, no, I know, I know who Abby Morgan is, but you're not it. So, you know, mm. Abby Morgan has left the room. You know, it's very strange feeling. And I think for my children, it was devastating and it was brutal. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I, originally when we first, when this first happened, we were told to use um, this neuropsychiatrist at the hospital told us to use theory A, theory B, which is theory A, 100%, this is not Abby Morgan, theory B, Jacob, you know, we can never be 100% sure of anything. So what if 99% this is not Abby? But we say 1% it could be. And the idea was they played with that percentage. And we all tried that for about three, four months and it just didn't work. And so very <laughs> quickly, it turned into a kind yeah. of, you're not Abby Morgan, yes I am, no, you're not, yes I am. And it became this ridiculous kind of punch and Judy to the point that actually it was comedy. And, I, and, and really the way I just, you know, Jake really gave me the great gift, which is one day I came in and he said, I've worked it out you must be working for the state. The state's employed you to come and help me and my children. And in a way I realized what he'd given me, he'd given me a reason to be in the room with him because I think he was trying to find a reason for me to come in every day that would make sense to him. Yes. And in doing that, yeah. I became someone who was working for the state. I mean, you know, just saying that, I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, it's very odd. It's four years on and I still find catching myself going, that's so crazy. Yeah. Um, but I guess yeah. what I realize is it's this is a crazy that touches many people in the world. You know, it's not just me that yeah. has experienced this. And we've seen this in, in light of dementia or traumatic brain injury as a result of a car crash. It's just very unusual um, that with Jacob, it came out of something that was later revealed to be an encephalitis of kind of a rare form of encephalitis called anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis. So, you know, in a way that you know, it was very unusual to see someone of Jacob's age go through that. You know, I, 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 I think there was a lot of older people who he'd gone through, but no one of Jacob's age. And so there was such a strong sense of needing to try and help Jake find his way back because we started to hope and see and realize that Jake potentially had quite a long life still to live, you know, when we yeah. they lose him. So that also became incredibly motivating. I think the other um, element of the book that I found uh, incredibly affecting and, and, uh, and impressive is what you refer to as the, the second plot twist, which is your own diagnosis with cancer and the, the, the chemotherapy and the operation that follows. And um, you write about it uh, again with, with, a, with a very bracing honesty, but also with terrific humor. Um, and I wondered if how it felt in the process of writing to become the subject of the of the emergency to to to, yeah. to to go from being an observer waiting patiently to suddenly being at the center uh how, how different it is to write that rather than this observational element you know i think life is a ball of string and the shock was we i could suddenly feel the end of it i could feel the tug and there was a looseness mm. and i was like oh my gosh so i think you know it, it was it was left to feel crazy you know when when i was diagnosed jacob came out of a coma in the end of January, 2018. And then in in the April, May, 2019, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And it was so left of field. It was another, as you said, absurd plot twist. Um, And I think when I felt my own mortality being questioned, I think that was one of the hardest things that I Mm. um, had to tell my children. And that to me is, you know, that is still the hardest thing because they felt, as I refer to in the book, they just felt not quite cooked. You know, they were 14 and 16 when Jacob collapsed. And I'm incredibly grateful that they got 14, 16 years of Jacob in a relatively healthy place. But there was still a lot of work, I felt, as a family that we had to do together and a lot of life we had to live together. And so I think when when a year in, it looked like I was also, um, you know, really hit by by another kind of medical crisis. Um, I think, you know, that's when that thing of leaning into it and really leaning into the support of those around you. And in a weird way, it was the least interesting element of the book for me, writing about my cancer. And I think that's partly because that's a little bit on ice as an experience for me. Mm. I, mm. I, I'm sure there's a lot more that I could emotionally plunder. And I'm incredibly, yeah. many people who write about breast cancer in an incredibly moving way and an important way. 
I think for me, it was just something I was trying to get through to get through to the other side. But weirdly, um, what I come to see and what I came to see in writing the book was that a little bit like, um, you know, like Jacob coming out with, uh, up with this idea of me working for the state, my breast cancer did one of two very strange things. Firstly, it, it became a kind of waking up for me that I had to start looking after myself. But also I think mm. for Jacob, it, he couldn't understand why he was feeling so much for this woman who worked for the state, why he was so acutely concerned about me. Um, yeah. And I, you know, it, you know, and, and I, and I sort of start to realize that, you know, Capgra delusion. It's, it's one of the things that's very interesting about it is that it's, a, it's, a, it's a severance of the visual and the emotional. When we look at someone, we also, our neurons also connect to an emotional pathway. So when I look at you, I have memories of great dinners and amazing books and films that I've loved and. And so I have a lot of feeling for you, but when Capra occurs, that that connection, feeling connection is cut. So when Jacob looked at me, he felt nothing. He kind of, I looked sort of like the woman he knew, but I, I just didn't feel anything. And when Jacob, I realized Jacob was starting to feel something, that was when I realized that there was some recovery happening. There was green yeah. shoots in the middle of it. So there's a moment where I talk about in the book where um, we went out as we often did to our to a little Italian restaurant near the ho the hospital. I was about to call it the hotel. There's a comedy. <laughs> That's so um, good. Next, near the the hospital, and um, you know we it's it, you know we looked by that point very strange. You know I was bald and bloated from my steroids, and so was Jake, and so we would sort of like two little Alan Bennett characters together, and we were sitting opposite each other uh, at a rest at a restaurant table, and he just looked at me, and I have a very flat back of the head. And Jake and I, Jake always jokes about it that I was my, you know, my mother left me too long in the pram. I just was never moved. So, and he just looked at me and leant forward and put his hand and cut the back of my head. And he said, your head's flat at the back. And I went, yeah. And he went like Abby Morgan. And I went, yeah, like Abby Morgan. And I could mm -hmm. just see in that moment, there was just this flicker of, I've got something wrong here. You know, there was just this moment. And it was a, it was the turning point for me that, that I started to realize that actually, although the cancer was brutal and you know I wouldn't wish it upon anyone, um, I was incredibly fortunate the drugs worked and will forever be grateful. You know, I knew that NHS was heroes for a long time before COVID happened, um, but I got through it. But also weirdly, I think it was Jacob starting to make a reconnection to me. And, yeah. and, and I guess when I, just as I started to come out of my treatment, so I went through a chemotherapy and mastectomy and radiotherapy and just as I was coming out for that in the spring of 2020 that was when Jacob started to vocalize and verbalize that maybe he was starting to see similarities with me and the real Abby Morgan I mean it's absurd I can hear myself yeah. Say it. so yeah so 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 that was it that was you know and in a way I try and prison that really I mean things you know life does tend to collapse like that you know one of the things I think mm. tries to explore you know you're someone who you know, what I always love about your work, David, is the way you capture the kind of extraordinary in the ordinary and the minutiae in, in the human condition. And often for me, it's about relationships at different stages, be it, you know, the older marriage of us or the kind of ever evolving marriage of, of student love through to, you know, 30 something love in one day. Um, and it's the greatest thing if you can try and capture something that is both unique and universal at the same time. Yeah. And I guess yeah. that's what I realized what I tried to focus on with Jacob and I is that I realized that we had a this was a thoroughly ordinary ordinary story, but something extraordinary was happening in the middle of it. Um, and yeah. so I that's where I say that that was the gift of it is as a writer, all I had to do was observe it. And the right ahead of me being able to observe it, I genuinely think is what saved me and kept my sanity in the middle of it all, you know. Um I think I just at this point should remind everyone that um, I don't do a lot of interviewing as you can probably tell and if you're sat there thinking I wish you'd ask about this then this would be a good time to start feeling questions through in the comments which you can do in the comments which I will I will ask um, as many as I can towards the end but uh, I I have this thing another habit of of I always take the dust jackets off books and if you have a copy of Abby's book and I think that which was designed by your your brother is my brother right? did it, yeah he's a graphic designer yeah. if you take the cover off it says inside it's a love story 
And um, I think that's the other thing uh, that I find extremely powerful in this in this book was that uh, amongst the the account of this emergency, there there are also these wonderful vignettes of a, a long relationship and a long time together, and that it's a very beautiful book about um, marriage and. Uh, uh, family as well and I, I wonder how you found obviously that's something that you've written about in drama but I wonder how you found writing about that in in memoir um, because it's it's often quite a hard thing to to write in one uh, about one's own experiences in a very in a very direct way of memoir rather than through drama yeah I mean I I, I guess um, I guess I tried to I guess I became probably the worst kind of narcissist, I guess, you know, because I became fascinated by the kind of alchemy and the chemistry of Jacob and I, not only now, but in the past, because, and again, I think that was because I was trying to hold on to sanity and, and almost reassure myself that we'd had a relationship. So inevitably, it meant that I traversed, you know, the, the, the highs and the lows of my relationship, of which there were, have been many, you know, so, and, and, I, and what I've always tried to do is I found the transparency and the, the kind of truthfulness and the honesty in which I'm often able to work and the, the choice of people I've chosen to work with to maintain that kind of ecosystem. So I work often with the same producers and the same script editors because they know me well enough to know that I may talk in a half sentence, but there'll be something at the end of it that yeah. will make sense. Or, and so it's, it created an honesty in me, in me which I try, I've tried to put on my own work. That's not to say that there isn't the writer who's looking for the punchline and, you know, is aware of the audience. But I guess, you know, one of the things that people have leveled back at me is, and one of the things I, I circle in the book is whose story is it? Is it mine? Is it his? Is it our family's? And I've come to realise that it's, it's the kind of story of us which I hadn't expected to write. Um, and that, that was my responsibility to do that because obviously Jacob wasn't able to do that. Um, and I, I found it very fascinating to go back and really understand and understand why I felt the brand of my family, the brand of our marriage had been so blown. Not that anyone else was mm. looking, but that I'd made this brand up myself, this ideal, this image of what I thought we had to be. And I had to go quite brutally back into it to sort of interrogate it and make sure that, you know, to knock off the corners off the bits that weren't important and to really retrieve the bits that were. And I didn't yeah. expect to write a love story. You know, that wasn't what I set out to write. In many ways, it was a rant and a rage and a fury and a kind of howl to the moon, really. Um, mm -hmm. And it was really my 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 publisher who went, you know, you've written a, a love story here. I mean, that came very, very late. Yeah. Um, but I guess if you've spent that long with someone, and, and one of the things that I guess came out of having spent that long time with someone, but also the rejection that was at the heart of that when Jacob didn't know me, was that I had to really start to look at Jacob as a person separate from me as my partner and my lover and my father and my children. And I, the fight came to try and bring Jacob back. And so I felt like I was yeah. really trying to understand Jacob and his psychology and all the reasons why I loved him. So, and I love those books. That's why, you know, I talk about your work. That's why I love the human condition. I love, I love the major happening, the minor. I love the earth shattering yeah. turning points being you know, as someone leaves to go away to, to university, I love the fact, you know, no one tells me, but the most profound moments for me, for me have happened in the, the, the least profound times, you know, you know, they often do yeah. have those tiny moments. So I guess it, again, it was just the gift and, and that transparency thing, I think people often say, God, you've really spilt your guts. Don't you feel very naked? Don't you feel very exposed? And weirdly, the truth will set you free. You know, there is a kind of truth in yeah. that. Yeah, like, yeah. Well, actually, what is there to hide? And I, I, there is still, I still have absolute privacy. Jacob and I have absolute privacy still. You know, we're not celebrities. We're not stars. We're not actors in that way. We're not out on the, you know, that's mm -hmm. why I think I've always loved being a writer. I could stand mm -hmm. behind the script. And I still feel like that about the book. The book, gets, the book is yeah. out in the world, but we're not out in the world. You know, our lives have gone yeah. on. Yeah. It's been a real joy for me. I mean, what's interesting is going back to now writing fiction you know, yeah. and hung and still trying to chase that kind of authenticity and truth. That's what I'm trying to do now. I mean, it's amazing to me that you were you were writing you were writing while all of this was going on and that writing the split that seems extraordinary. I want did you, did you find that it was informing your script work in any way? I don't I, I don't well weirdly in, we in direct ways. I was right. I was just finishing up on the. I was writing the second series when Jacob collapsed and we were shooting it when I had cancer. 
And I think I was so in motion then, I don't think I was capturing that. I think the third series, when actually was in a much more relative period of calm. Yeah. I wrote really when Jacob was home and we were going through recovery. I think that third series, that final series, which really looks at, at, at issues of mortality and profound love and loss and grief and joy and you know survival of a family, despite the fact they're blown apart in many ways. Um, I think all of that has been absolutely informed by what I've gone through. Mm. Really. And, and I think weirdly, I think the series has gathered and garnered love over the, as it's evolved over the three series, but there's something about this series that I think landed. Yeah. Like, and that's just to do with the brilliance of the writing. And, um, you know, certainly the brilliance of the acting, but I also think it's come out of COVID. You know, I think we'd all, we'd yeah. all really, you know, and that's the other thing, you know, I guess my story is set against now much bigger, much more complex, difficult, um, medical catastrophe that the world's gone through and so it yeah. feels like it's one story in the middle of it and yet there are some kind of universal connections so I I really feel like the kind of love that the split got also came out of people people's love for their own families people's desire to make connections on mm. a human level and that's I think mm. it was a marriage of those three things what I'd gone through the show itself and COVID and what everyone else in the globe had gone through really I mean I think that that you mentioned it earlier, but there's a terrific sense of community in the book as well, not just within family, uh, but but with, within the the healthcare system and the carers who who you come to know as well. And I I, I found that uh, again very affecting, touching part of the book. I suppose again, I I realize I keep going back to this notion of of um, of fiction versus memoir and. You talk in the book about, because it's in the book probably, but you talk in the book about how, how you sometimes will talk to an actor and provide them with biographical notes, maybe details in their past, kind of backstory, the things that will help them uh, with their motivation and their journey. And I wondered when you yourself become the central character, if, if, if that is indeed what you are, were there any discoveries when you found yourself examining um, your reaction to the situation, um, uh, the history of your relationship, were there things that made sense? And did that have, again, it's something you talk about in the book, did that in any way feel like a, a catharsis or therapy of, of some kind? Uh, it's interesting because I think that the, the, the strength, the connection, the understanding I found about myself <clears throat> really came out of... Um, what Jacob had actually given to me. You know, I think, you know, I completely, I mean, I had a, one of those thunderbolt, instant love at first sight feelings for Jacob. He took a lot longer, <laughs> you know, it wasn't the same for him. And I would genuinely say, I still feel in many ways the same way about him now as I did, you know, over 20 years ago. So, yeah. um, but Jacob has always, Jacob's always been the joy. You know, he's, he's like, he's human, you know, he's human, he has his faults, but, He's always been the joy. He's always been the risk taker. He's always been the, the, the finder of fun. And he's always been the one who's constantly pushed me not to take myself so seriously, but be very serious about my work, be very serious about writing as truthfully as I can, but not to take myself too seriously. And, you know, you give what you get. You know, Jacob had given mm -hmm. me so much that the book was really me returning back the kind of you know, the echo chamber of what we had together. And so I guess what I discovered is that our relationship was much more robust than I thought it was, you know, and I think we've yeah. gone, you know, I talk about the times we've gone to marital therapy and I talk about my jealousies and I talk about, you know, those moments of deep insecurity and those moments of dislike. And, but what I also found when I sort of trawled my way through that story was, was the love, the connection. And also I had the living proof of it, my children, um, who were so brilliant, but also in the house that we built together, which sounds ridiculous, but you know, yeah. just Jacob has really woven his way into our house, the relationships with his family, you know, a lot of things helped me, us connect back to each other, which I write about. I mean, one of my first and most profound memories was, was the Chris, first Christmas Jacob came home. And at this point he had no initiation, very, very little initiation or agency on anything, but he was able to read the Hanukkah prayer word for word in Hebrew. And, you know, we are culturally Jewish, not, not necessarily religiously Jewish, but, you know, his family, he's always been brought up in a very Jewish household. And for me, that echo back to something, which I didn't realize was already so important to me, but echoed back to him, 
really made me ask profound questions about Jacob's identity, the identity of what we had been, what it was like to live with the Jewish person, you know, when you're not Jewish, what it's like to, you know, not be married and then become that, you know, and then get married, what it's like to raise teenagers in a, in a city where there's so much going on and um, there's so much access and excess. And, yeah. you know, one of the things that was key that you mentioned was, it, 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 you know, one of the things I learned was that resilience and that ability to write is also what literally saved us. It meant that I could earn money to pay for the humongous amount of care that Jacob needed. And that's the one thing that mm. I'm navigating now. How, what's the next thing I can do in relation to care? Because it's one of the profound problems with the NHS, which is I think it works incredibly hard to keep people alive, but the aftercare, you know, it's a broken system. Mm. And so yeah. there is no aftercare. And so I also learned that the very thing that I do to write to save me physically and mentally, but it also helped save Jacob's life because it paid for the very things I think is which led him to find his way back home yeah. which is all the therapies and all the neuro work and all the occupational therapy and speech and language and physio you know uh, and that was all add-on it was nothing on offer um, so mm. I guess I've got a profound sense of you know that in my world when I grew up acting the arts was a job it wasn't about kind of some esoteric sort of flight of fancy it was how you paid your bills and it was really good to mm. test it again so profoundly and realize that it, it also could bail me out of the most difficult situations does that sort of yeah. answer your question in a very yeah way? no it, it it does i i no i i i think it does i think it's um i mean i think what is i mentioned it earlier but it, what is uh, a wonderful aspect of the book is is the story of a, a relationship as well and i imagine there was a certain amount of uh, introspection, but also nostalgia and looking back at good times and bad times, and that that that's a, that's um that's a process that often can be quite um, surprising and revealing. Mm. I think it's uh, um, uh, I I realised that I should I should um, move on to. I mean, I had two very quick questions. The, the questions are coming thick and fast, but I had two questions which I which I hesitated about because I wondered if they were sort of. Uh, nosy in some way the first i suppose was that it started as a you, you, you said that you thought of it initially as a as a play and often when dramatists uh write prose when i went from writing scripts to writing a novel the the first note i got from my editor was it's okay to tell people uh it's okay to tell readers what the characters are thinking because in the screenplay you know you have to get through that and you have dialogue and action but you can't stop for an internal monologue and uh, the internal monologue in this book is so uh eloquent and emotional it's clearly not something that you you struggled with at all i suppose what i'm wondering is do you think it could have another life in another form and is that something that now it's a book you might look you might be thinking about. Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm not, I mean, I've, I'm, I've obviously I've sold the film rights, and I will, I, right. you know, I am, I'm thinking about adapting it, but I'm, but I'm trying to yeah. justify why I adapt, why I would adapt it, and and how, what would make it different. I mean, in a way, I'd be very curious about how you feel about adapting your own novels and that kind of transition, and doing that, and also you hand yeah. over to writers because it's one of the things that I'm thinking about. You know, I've just started to direct a little bit. I'm no auteur, I may add, but I'm. I'm sort of tentatively looking at, well, if I did do it, would I direct it? How would I do it? I guess one of two things for me, it would be about um, telling the rest of it a little bit more of the story, not much more, but just an, enough to, mm. you know, to, to show the kind of relatively happy, if very human, normal ending that we have ha managed to get to in the place we've managed to get to in terms of Jake's brilliant recovery. Um, but I, I mean, how I, 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 I can see there's a, weirdly, I still feel there's a play in it, but I, I also feel like my other head's going, move on, come on, um, you know, yeah, yeah. of this, move on, come on. And so that's the, that's the voice that I'm circling at the moment. But how do you feel about yeah. when, can I throw that question back to you? Mm, you yeah. Your novels and when you start to, you know, you, when you write a novel, be it us or one day, are you thinking this will make a great film or are you writing it for the sake of writing it in that form? I mean, genuinely not, because the, the thing I love about writing fiction is the ability to move it. When I read a book, I think inevitably, how would you adapt this? And there are certain things which are very, very hard to do on, on screen, as you know, like children growing up is more or less impossible. In, in prose, you can move very fluidly through time and place. You know, you can write, I remembered when, 
And mm -hmm. in a screenplay, you just have to put a big fat line through that because what are you going to do? Go back and build a set from, mm -hmm. of a childhood home? I mean, you just can't do it. So there's a kind of fluidity and space in prose that I really, really relish, while at the same time knowing that the things that I that I tend to write three act structures, you know, I just do instinctively. And the thing that I enjoy writing most is dialogue and dialogue is very adaptable. So I, I would be disingenuous of me to say, I often, if I come up with a story, I will consciously think, would this work better in script form? I is it about action and dialogue? And is it set in a certain framework, frame of time? And, uh, or do I want the kind of freedom and control that you get when you write prose? Because, you know, a novel also, a novel is 130,000 words and screenplay is rarely more than 110 pages. So often the process of adaptation is just about pricey, you know, it's just about cutting stuff and, and it, that can be very frustrating and painful. So I, I love being able to do both. And, but they give me very different things. And I, I, even though they do sometimes cross over, I try to be quite disciplined at making a, about making a book, the best book it can possibly be, while at the same time, you know, filling it with scenes and set pieces and a beginning, a middle and an end, mm. and all of those things that, mm. that are central to a screenplay. But I, that's, that's um, I, think I could go on and on and on. No, I want to go on, I wish I could go on about that. And the questions are piling up. So um, I will just um, just working through from the top. Uh, the, the next, the last question, which again you can answer. Uh, you don't even need to answer at all. Is I just wondered how Jacob was and whether there was a, a yeah, kind of he's amazing. To, he's to, made this extraordinary recovery um, in the last sort of uh, nine months. You know, and it, it it was very odd. It was incredibly slow. It's the old Buddhist phrase, you know, love the flower in winter when it says nothing. And you think nothing's happening for what felt like years. And then very rapidly, probably a year ago, he started to literally wake up and the conversation right. and the wit and the humor came out. And he's phenomenal now. He's uh, our last carer left in the beginning of May and he loves to travel. He's very, very smart. Yeah, he's got some, you know, some physical, some cognitive um, issues that are, will be ongoing and, and permanent. Um, but he's fantastic. He's he's funny. He's lovely to live great. with. So I feel very That's fortunate. That's great to hear. Him. Him back. Got him back. Yeah. I'm very pleased to hear that. Um, uh, I uh, First question, does Jake have a sense of having missed this? experience because of the coma yeah I think it's very very I think you know one of the things I get asked is has Jacob read the book and he hasn't mm. and you know I felt every emotion on that I felt incredibly nervous when he hadn't read it I felt very nervous about him reading it um I feel a deep understanding of why he doesn't read it and I think he's trying to make sense yeah. a lot of that is that very thing of he is still piecing it together you know because time collapsed and folded in for him and so there are memories that he's completely lost. Certainly, you know, that whole coma period, he had no memory of at all. Um, mm -hmm. But I would say the good, a good year, year and a half afterwards as well, he has very little memory of. So when you start to piece together time, I think one of the key things has been very hard for him to get his head around the fact that the children are 20 and 18, because for him, it's, yeah. it's been a few months. Yeah, goodness. Do, do, do uh, uh, what is the response? And this has also come up in the questions. Um, uh, of, of your family I mean yeah, how has well, the resp response to the book been well I you know I from the people who feature in it yeah I wouldn't have published the book without you know making sure that they had all read it first and so it was published on the agreement mm. that they were all happy with it so my children were the first to read it and then my family and Jacob's family read it and they were incredibly supportive I mean I was really lucky in their support and I think they've understood and really appreciate just how profoundly helpful it's been for me and so they've they've been you know they've been but they were absolutely my first critics my first readers and when my daughter read it she went mum are you okay about people not liking you <laughs> after this and I was like oh no so yeah they've been yeah they've been amazing I um I wondered I mean I have to say I didn't find that at all I think I think the Abbey in the book is 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 fantastically I mean did you recognize me as someone who yeah knows, I absolutely did, did it feel like I'd, I'd done a bit of a trick what did no, you do? I, I didn't feel I didn't and I also didn't feel that anything was being censored or, or, or held back it reminded me there's a wonderful book by Helen Garner have you read The Spare Room by Helen Garner yeah I have which which is incredibly bruising and frank about the limits of compassion and how, how mm. being a, the demands of being a carer and how how frustrating that can be 
Um, and that's a very tough book. This I found very moving and emotional and romantic in lots of ways. So, mm. so I said, and, and funny, you know, so I certainly, I certainly did recognize you. Um, uh, this is another question. If you were going to write a novel, which I think you should, <laughs> do you, what would be the topic and how, what do you think would be the benefits of writing it in, in a fiction form rather than a screenplay? Well, well, you know, I have to say, I mean, David, that's, you know, because you're someone I've always hugely admired that you've been able to write books from, so right from the understudy and Start of a Ten and all of those. Start of a Ten was a book first, wasn't it? I'm not crazy. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So both of those books I remember reading very early on and, and being hugely impressed by that and thinking, God, why, why prose, why prose? I think it's taken me till I'm in my 50s to truly understand the joy of it. I mean, one of the things I find is that in television now, I tend to be the oldest person in the room. And there is a little yeah. part of me that lo is loving the joy of the simplicity of writing and not having a room full of, of editors who I love deeply and I have relied on essentially for my my process but to have those periods where I just sit and write something for a few months has been great so I have got a novel that I am brewing on at the moment great uh, very different very different world at very different time but I'm brewing on it and I, I will become that person who gets drunk at a party and say yes I'm working on my novel and never yeah. ever finishes it <laughs> But I find the process, I mean, the process is so different with 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 the screenplay, you throw away so much and there's so many opinions and, you know, it's, it, it's, it's quite shocking to me when you, you know, writing a book, the degree to which you kind of in charge and of course you're edited and the editing is often wonderful, but it's, it's a world away from the kind of often quite ruthless editing. Totally. An interpretation uh, of of screenwriting. Have yeah. you have you enjoyed the pro the process? Of I have. I've really loved it. I've really loved it, and I really love the joy and the as you said, the simplicity of it. I love that feeling of, you know. I I think what what often happens as well. You start doing half drafts in in screenwriting. You know, you're redrafting and redrafting. It's it becomes a little bit like you know the fashion for small plates in a restaurant. I sometimes feel like screenwriting becomes like that. You're trying so many different yeah. flavors that at the end you're like, did I actually eat anything? You know what? what yeah. You know, and it sometimes feels like that was the purity for me of sort of sitting down and and and, and taking out that chicken and basting it and cooking it and then eating it. It's yeah. very, it's a very full experience. And I, I, it's very addictive, although, and I love the isolation of it actually, because one of the things yeah. I find is, you know, don't you love it when things get canceled in your diary and you suddenly find a trip's been canceled and you've got four days yeah, and you don't want to tell anyone because you just want to go, okay, I'm going to deep dive into something. Well, it doesn't happen very often, but when that does happen, that's really, oh, it lovely. is really lovely. It is. I mean, I think it's it's no accident. There's a cliche, isn't there, when a, a novelist on screen finishes a novel and they type the end and they, they smoke their cigar and everything. You couldn't do that with a screenplay because it doesn't ever have that kind of finality. It's just going to get moved around and torn to bits. Totally. And, you know, it's, it's, it's endless. Um, they're a really good question. So I want to, I want to just whiz through a few. Did you encourage your children to write about their experiences um, there's um, a very touching thing Mabel yeah Mabel Mabel made a series of recordings which I talk about briefly um and she very sweetly said mommy li listen to them but I really felt profoundly that was her experience it was the one area I could not you know I, I'd stop myself putting my size six boots and you know flourishing through it um, mm. I, I think for both my children I, I think as an experience it will imprint them on on them for the rest of their lives and I think it's no surprised that my son's studying neuroscience now and is fascinated with memory and it's all it's all about neuroscience around memory that is his big sort of focus and that I think my daughter is very creative will probably find a way to express it somehow but you know I think they're teenagers and actually the one thing they were slightly cheated of as a lot of teenagers were during covid you know but that period where something very heavy hits your life you want to encourage them mm. not to think about it you want to encourage them to go through life and hopefully life will help them process it so um, yeah. I imagine one day they might write something about it, but 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 I really feel that will be their thing. Do you think um, uh, uh, this uh, again is to do with the nature of writing prose? How did you decide on the form and the tense of the writing and 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 maintain it for the duration of the book? It, and how did you know yeah. where to end it? Did you just have this? I mean, I know you read a lot of fiction, but mm. did you have a was that sense kind of innate that it should be? written in this yeah way. I felt I felt like I well in a weird way it felt like a fugue that came over me and when I reached the point of that final fugue where it felt like there was a natural sort of 
uh, we'd hit a kind of piece of dry land, as I refer to it. It was that feeling that we were almost hitting a bit of dry land. It felt like the right place to leave it. I didn't want to leave it in a place of absolutes. And I guess it also slightly related to my time. You know, I started writing it in October, November um, 2020, and the book ends. There's a little footnote, really, uh, to the spring of 2021, but the book kind of covers that period. And I think it was just when I was starting to feel like that was the kind of arc of that story and we were starting to reconnect again as a family and so that felt like the journey of losing ourselves as a family was sort of coming to its end you know we'd found we were starting to find ourselves again um I d yeah I mean I I think one of the hardest things we, we talked about it when you read it the hardest things was you know is it the first person is it the third person who am I you know the book oscillates between me talking directly to Jacob the you and then you know mm. you know very much in the third person the he so I, I oscillate all the time and I don't always get it mm. right it's one of the things I think really shows my inexperience at prose writing actually um but there is an well, I think you, I it's think meant to be quite ragged <laughs> It's good to be right, but I think there is something <laughs> kind of ragged in it and, and imperfect in it, and that's sort of because it came out of the emotion and the the experience, really, which yeah. was ragged in an imperfect experience. I mean, that's what I felt. It's true that there are, you know, that the the, the the form the form fits the experience. That there will be an anecdote, and then you'll be somewhere else, and then you'll be in the past, and then you know there'll be a vision of the future, and then there'll be a, a little bit of family biography, and you know it it, it has that quality, I suppose, of to a certain degree of kind of watching and waiting and observing uh, that 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 um that feels you know absolutely apt for this story uh, so i hope i didn't give you any notes because i didn't think i had any i yeah, just thought did. it was i think it was it was wonderful. Batch notes, I think, <laughs> the other way around <laughs> um i just there's just I, I was lucky enough to come to one of the launch events and i met a number of these people so i just there's a question here of the medics uh, who treated jacob read the book they must be thrilled to have such a poignant memoir that explains this syndrome and condition yeah. and it does feel a very populated book yeah um, well yeah i mean i you know i i mean the, you know jake and my life was saved by uh the doctors and in fact i saw my oncologist today and gave her a copy of the book so um, so she was very late to get it. But yes, Jacob's key consultants, most of them have read it and have been amazingly supportive. Um, and of course, the therapists who we employed were amazing from, you know, his neuropsychiatrist through to the physio and the occupational therapist. And they've all just been mm. fantastic. And in fact, came to our launch port party. So they were such a, well, they were essential in, in, in saving our lives, yeah. saving Jake. So yeah, they've read it. It was great to meet some of them and, and talk about it. And there was, um, I think in that in that room at the at the launch party, a terrific sense of of kind of um, of of love and warmth, uh, and I, I think that's all in the book. And and so I, we have to wind up now. But it's been uh, lovely to talk about it. I mean, I've heard you talk about the book a, a couple of times, and it's never fails to um, I, I never fail to be moved and uh, amazed by the experience, and but also impressed by the skill and the eloquence and honesty with which you write about it so it's been thank very you, lovely to talk to you about it thank you thank you for the be, being the one for asking the questions but also for your lovely generous soul that has really supported this book when I first wrote it and you were one of the first readers to read it so I really really appreciate everything the book's here oh no it's, it's a pleasure there are... thank you I well, got bumped off the front cover by Meryl Streep. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, oh, damn it. She may have done that to several people, I think. I, I don't terrible. think you'll be alone in that. <laughs> That's terrible. Um, thank you both so, so much. That was just a completely magical hour and I could have listened to you for the rest of the evening. It was so full of insights and warmth and just kind of wonder. And Abby, we're so pleased that this has a success story that you're back together and it is absolutely the nicest uh, the nicest way to end and it makes me feel very uh, in the middle of all these terrible things that seem to be swirling around us it's extremely heartwarming and wonderful to read your book and to listen to you and David the same is true for you you know your books are very uplifting for all of us so thank you both very much for sharing the time with us please buy all David's books watch his screenplays and please go out and get a copy of Abby's book because it's it's absolutely her title is right it is not a pity memoir it's an amazing wonderful read and I had I was a bit shocked to hear you say you felt very amateur as you were writing this uh, piece of non-fiction because it certainly doesn't come across like that it's just a great great read 
and it's lovely to see you. Thank you. Thanks so much. much Thank you. Thank you to everyone for being here, and we'll see you soon. We've got Thank Colin Pogby and Wayne Arin coming up, all sorts of great people. So watch this space. Thanks a lot, and good night. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.